you love Christmas? Yeah. I want to draw your attention to uh, Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. So if you have a Bible, it's in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. While he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And you will, or she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Christmas is uh, such a great time of the year. Such a time where we think about what life is really all about. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, people are thinking about goodwill on earth and peace on earth. They're thinking about being nice to each other. Even if they don't actually be nice to each other, at least they're thinking about it. And there's the idea that uh, it's better to give than to receive. And people take such joy in shopping and getting gifts and thinking about what the person would really want, you know, what the, is going to be the look on their face when they open that gift and they see that present for the first time. I remember my little sister when, when she was just a small one and she just really started talking. And I remember the first Christmas when she was really talking a lot and every single present that she opened, her sentence was the same. It was, oh, just what I've always wanted. <laughs> every single thing. That was her line. And there's just such joy in the house when... Uh, you, you're, you know, you've thought about someone else, you've, you've given something to someone else. And so Christmas for us is, is a great time. It's a time for family. It's a time to share together. It's a time to um, gather with loved ones. But all of that really ultimately uh, is about Jesus. And, and really, he's, he's the, the one who's had such an impact that even the people who don't believe in him are celebrating his birthday by giving gifts. Even the people that don't believe that he's God's gift for our, our sins. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the best Christmas verse of all in my mind, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So even people that don't believe in Jesus are celebrating with gift giving. They're celebrating his birthday. And, and even if they say, well, we don't even talk about him, we don't pray at our Christmas celebration, and, and for us, you know, it's just, a, it's just a time for getting together, but still, the impact of that person, and in particular, I think, and what I want to draw your attention to in the short message tonight is what the angel told Joseph about, about the baby that was going to be born and what his name should be, because Joseph and Mary did not name Jesus. God named him. He didn't uh, come into the world and his parents, you know, Joseph, his stepdad, obviously God, his father, but they could have sat and talked. And what do you want to name? Well, for the boys, here's the names I want. For the girls, here's the names that I want. And then maybe they don't agree and they flip a coin. I don't know how you named your kids. Um, we didn't flip any coins, but we were close with, uh, I think, Bethany. We weren't really sure for a while, but, um, you know, you know, what's this person's name going to be? Well, the angel appeared to him and said, your betrothed wife is with child, but don't be afraid to take her to be your wife because that which is in her is, is of the Holy Spirit. She's never known a man, and yet she's become pregnant. It's not through the influence of, of a man. The, the child that's in her is going to be the Savior of the world, and he's going to have a special name. His name is going to be Jesus. The name Jesus is a Greek word. It's the Greek form of, of a Hebrew name. So when you say Jesus, you're actually saying the Hellenistic version of his Hebrew name. His Hebrew name would be Joshua. And that name has a meaning. And the meaning is 
I am the name of God when God revealed himself to Moses when Moses said who shall I tell Israel your people that sent me and and God said I am that I am and Moses had asked him what's your name God's answer was I am that's my name now that's an interesting name in that uh, it begs for an object it's it's a it's a an unfinished sentence if you will if you saw me after the service and you saw me in line and I'm trying to decide between the line where the desserts are, well, it's not really a decision for me, but the uh, <laughs> decision's been made, but, you know, the, the line with the savory or the sweet, and, and you looked at it and you said, well, Rich, how are you doing? And I said, I am. You'd be waiting for something more, wouldn't you? You'd say, keep going, Pastor, come on, come on, what is it that you are? You am what? You know, you, you can't just be I am, you have to be I am something, you're it's an unfinished sentence. Well, God said, saying, I am that I am, it's an unfinished sentence. So what is God saying when he says, my name is I am? He's saying, I'm your healer. I'm your savior. That's the name Jesus. Jehovah Shua, I am your salvation. I'm your righteousness. I'm your peace. I'm your banner or I'm your victory. I'm your hope. I'm your shepherd. I'm, I'm your resurrection. I'm your life. I'm your door. I'm your way, I'm your truth, I'm your life. You just think, what, what is it that your need is? That's, we think about Christmas and why Christmas has such an impact and why it's so powerful is because of the person, because of that person's name and who he is and what he represents and what he's done. He's God's revelation of himself, fully human. He has Mary as his mother, fully God, God as his father. He has both natures, unlike anyone else. He's fully God and fully man. And his name, Jesus, he'll be the savior of his people. I will save my people from their sins. You could say that his name is his mission. That's really what verse 21 had said. She will bring forth a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You want to know who this person is that we're celebrating his birth? He's I'm your savior. That name itself would describe. I want to talk about two things tonight. First, his name and then his mission. But his name is his mission. His name is so important to us. I want to read a couple of verses to you. Listen to Matthew 12, verses 15 through 22. Great multitudes followed Jesus, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth victory, or justice to victory. And this last verse, verse 21, the first part of verse 21, and in his name the Gentiles will trust. You see, Matthew talking about the ministry of Jesus, all these people coming to him and, and how he received anyone who would come. And Matthew says this is fulfilling what the prophet said. Now Isaiah is writing not a week before Jesus came, not a year before, but 700 years before Jesus came. Think of what was going on 700 years ago. Could someone have written with, with uh, very uh, great directness 700 years ago, about 2013? the condition or, or an individual, what their life would be like. Isaiah is writing around 700 B.C., and he's writing about the ministry of the Messiah when he will come, and he's describing him, how he'll be so gentle that you'd have a smoking flax. What a, what a person to celebrate. His name is Jesus. He'll save his people. He's a savior. He's not a snuffer. He's not someone that looks at you and goes, you know what, you're barely there. I'm going to snuff you out. He's somebody that will... Well, get the fire going again. Maybe your fire's gone out a little bit. Jesus will, he won't snuff out a smoldering flax. He'll, he'll fan it back into flame. He's a savior. And that last sentence, in his name, the Gentiles will trust. Not only just for the Jewish people, but for any human being. For all ages, Jesus is the savior. He will save his people, Israel, from their sins. But that name Jesus is a name for someone like me. I'm not Jewish. I'm not descended from Abraham. I'm outside of the covenant of God. All the promises of God for Israel in the Old Testament, they don't apply to me. Now, I have some friends who are Jewish, 
Those promises apply to them. <laughs> they don't apply to me, but thank God there's promises in the Bible that apply to me as a Gentile. My family has been pagan since they walked off the ark, I think. <laughs> you know, we go way back. We're, we're old-time sinners, uh, professional idol worshipers, if you might say something like that. You see, I'm a Gentile. I'm someone that was a stranger to God. But here in the ministry of Jesus, even to the Jewish people, Matthew bringing out this prophecy and saying, no, it's in his name that the Gentiles will trust. He'll even save the Gentiles. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, speaking about his name and the work of Jesus in the last days. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the remnant whom the Lord calls. A prophecy about how things will turn out in the last days. A prophecy of God pouring out His Spirit on boys and girls, on servants and on free people, that, that indiscriminately God would pour out His Spirit on all flesh in these last days, and that whoever calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. Christmas is so wonderful because of that name, that there's a name that you can call on and be saved. Now, if you're uh, drowning, I have a great friend. His name's Mike Harris. He's an amazing swimmer. He's one of the youngest uh, lifeguards uh, to ever lifeguard at Newport Beach. Uh, when he was a kid, he was by far the youngest guy there. Uh, so I think started lifeguarding as soon as he was 18. He's on the beach. Great surfer. Guy can hold his breath for, I think he has gills, actually. I don't even know if he holds his breath. <laughs> Listen, if you're drowning and you call out his name, well, you're going to be saved. But what if you're dying in your sin? What if you're ashamed? What if you're guilty? What if you've done things and you look at your life and you say, man, I need a savior. Whose name can you call on and be saved? Which name would you cry out to? Would you say, Barack Obama, save me. Now listen, maybe you don't like the health care. You might want to call him. You know, you could, I mean, he's got, he's got some power as the president of the United States. Maybe you're having trouble getting your pension from the military. Well, that, his name might be the appropriate name to call out to in a whole bunch of different circumstances. But if you need to be saved from your sins, whose name are you going to call out on? Now, you could call me. You say, well, I'm going to call you. And you could call me and you say, I'm in my sins. And I'm going to point you to the name that you need to call on. I can't help you with that. I'm a sinner myself. I have to call on the same person you have to call on. And I know what his name is. Do you know what his name is? We're celebrating his birthday tomorrow. His name's Jesus. He saves people from their sins. You call on his name and you can be saved. I want you to listen to this exchange about his name. After the apostles, Peter and John, were going into the temple. Remember, they were going in at the hour of prayer. It's in Acts chapter 3. And there was a man at the gate of the temple. And he was begging. And Peter looked at him. And he said... Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. Notice, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter healed that guy, but how did he do it? Does Peter have power to heal? Does Peter have like a special force that comes out of his fingertips? And he can just, because he wants to, go and make people better? He can't. But that man who needed healing, Peter knew someone who could heal him. And the man was healed in the name of Jesus. Peter said, it's in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, this is a person that we're talking about. Jesus is not some inanimate object or a force, like a Christ spirit that is in everyone. Jesus is a person. He's an individual. He was born. We're celebrating his birthday tomorrow. He actually came into the world through his mother's womb. The Bible says that Mary brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger. Jesus was a person. He is a person. He's without beginning, without end, the Alpha and the Omega. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's a person. And this person, he was, he's from Nazareth. He's Jesus from Nazareth. Jesus the Christ, the Savior, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecy. So Peter tells this man who's never walked, he's been lame from his mother's womb, he's over 40 years old, you can only imagine what his legs must have looked like, he never used them, he didn't have physical therapy, didn't have somebody that once a week he went and they stretched his legs out, probably already had the onset of some kind of arthritis, I mean, he had a very difficult life, sitting there, legs knurled up, begging for an alms, and Peter looks at him and said, in the name of Jesus, grabs him by the hand and yanks him up. And in the name of Jesus, that guy was healed. It's the name of Jesus. He's the Savior. He can save people. He can heal people. So later on, the people were running up to the guy. The guy went for a lap. He started running around the temple. Some of you kids will be doing that after the service. <laughs> if your parents neglect you. <laughs> but your parents won't do that. Your parents will watch you keep track of you. They won't get lost in their conversation with their friends while you run wild. <laughs> They're going to discipline you. Keep, keep an eye on you. He was running laps. We won't have any of that. He was walking and leaping and praising God, it says. And he was worshiping the Lord. And the people recognized it was the guy, but his legs were fine. And he came to Peter and John. He grabbed hold of him. He's holding on to him. And the people came and they assumed these guys did it. They must have done it. And they were looking at him. Peter began to preach to them, and he said this. It's Acts chapter 3, verse 16. He said, And his name, speaking about Jesus, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You see, we could say the same thing tonight. Our lives, it was through faith in his name that this man stands before you today. It was Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. Apart from that name, I wouldn't be standing here. Now, I wasn't physically lame, but I can tell you I was spiritually lame. I was lost, man. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. Sin had a hold of my life, and I had no interest in a Savior. And yet Jesus still came and found me, still came and spoke to me, still came and set me free, even when I didn't want to be set free. Came and began to reveal himself to me, speaking to me about my predicament, how dangerous it was, how I was in danger of being lost for eternity, separated from God. He told me how much he loved me, called me to himself. Faith in the name of Jesus healed that guy. It's healed millions and millions of people, the name. Peter says it's that name. Then later he is brought before the Jewish leaders and they want to know what he's doing, how you know he's preached, 5,000 people now start following they ask him, tell us what name? You know, he's on trial. What name did you do this? Like, what are you going to say to that, Peter? Peter's answer, he sums it up in this last statement, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now listen, Santa Claus can't save you from your sins. He can't. It's impossible. But Jesus can. There is salvation in no other name, Peter said. It's the name Jesus. Jesus can save you. Now, I want you to listen how it unfolds because they were not happy with that answer, the religious leaders. They didn't like that at all. And they said this. Their words were, so that this would spread no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, these apostles, so that from now on they would speak to no man in this name. And they called them and they commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. Can you imagine being told not to talk about Jesus? <laughs> Sorry, I can't obey that law. Now, driving 55, I should obey. Or 65 or whatever the posted speed limit is. You know, I should obey that. That's the law of the land. But to not speak about the name of Jesus? That's the name that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. That's the name that, that will produce perfect soundness in you. That's the name that will heal you. That person, Jesus of Nazareth, he's the one who's the Savior of the world. How could I not speak or teach in his name? So they were told that. They went back to their uh, brethren. They prayed together at the end of their prayer. The, in uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 29 and 30, they said, Now, Lord, look at their threats. 
And grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. So they're told, don't say anything else about this name. And they go back and pray and they say, Lord, pour it on. We want to do more in the name of Jesus. Don't talk about that name. Lord, help us to do more in the name of Jesus. More people being healed. More people being touched. The world that I live in, there's a lot of people that need to be touched by Jesus. I've seen a lot of drunks that need to be touched by Jesus. A lot of potheads, stoners, that need to be set free from that bondage. I've seen a lot of people that have anger problems, and it's ruining their life. They need to be set free by Jesus. There's so many that need to hear that name. So they're praying, Lord, pour it on. Give us more power. Do more miracles in the name of your holy child, Jesus. That it would be in the name of Jesus. Jesus, the Savior. Now, after that happens, of course, what do you think the Lord did? He poured out his spirit. More things happened. So they brought him back in. They brought him back before the same council, the same court. And they set him before the council, Acts chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. And they, the high priest asked them, and he said, Didn't we command you, or strictly command you, not to teach in this name? And then later, they beat them. And at the end of the chapter, it says, They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The name of Jesus. Would you be willing to suffer shame for that name? Absolutely. Man, he's a savior. If someone doesn't like his name, well, they just don't understand him. I'm not ashamed of that name. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation. It's, it's through Jesus that, that people can be saved. Daily and in the temple and every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Philip, when he went to Samaria in Acts chapter five, 8, verse 5, it says Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to them. Later in verse 12, when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. When Jesus called Saul of Tarsus and he becomes the Apostle Paul, when he's telling Ananias to come baptize him in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, listen, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Do you know what day we're celebrating tomorrow? It's Merry Christmas. There's a big fat word right in the middle of that, that greeting. Now, people say happy holidays. That's fine. As long as you know which holiday it is. Happy holidays. Happy Jesus' birthday. We're celebrating the coming of Christ. We're celebrating the person who could save people. We want to bear his name. Peter preaching to the first Gentile convert. At the very end of his sermon, the Holy Spirit comes down upon the, upon the Gentiles while he's still preaching. He doesn't even give a Billy Graham-style altar call. He's preaching, and the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. They start speaking in tongues, right, in the middle of a sermon. Acts chapter 10, verse 43, the last sentence he says before that happened, Peter said to him, to Jesus, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. Through his name, whoever believes in him, it's through his name, that name that's above every name. You know Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Who has the name that's above every name? Michael Jordan? Who's the greatest basketball player ever? Who's won more championships than Michael Jordan? Some of you old timers. There used to be some fellas that played that were pretty good back in the day. A guy named Bill Russell. He's got a few rings, I think. Look, at this. he's got one for every finger. <laughs> A lot of hardware. There was a fella named Will Chamberlain. I think he scored a few points in his day. You see, who's, got, who's the greatest? Who's the name that's above every name? Now, if you're going to play a pickup basketball game here at the church, if Jordan's on your team, you're probably going to win. But if you're playing basketball and you're playing with, with us, you probably don't need Michael Jordan. Just get one of the kids from the high school basketball team and you're going to win. It's all relative, isn't it? If you need a savior, whose name? If you're fighting the devil, if there's something spiritual going on in your life and you need help, whose name are you going to call on? If you're having something spiritual going on, you're going to go, 
in the name of Michael Jordan. <laughs> You're going to call in the name of Jesus, aren't you? That's what we're celebrating, his name. And just like the angel told Joseph, his name is his mission. What's Jesus' mission? He's going to save his people. His mission is to save. He's going to save his people from their sins. How does he do that? How does Jesus save people? Does he have a life preserver? Like my friend Mike, who's a lifeguard, and he would swim out with people, and he'd have the big red buoy, and he'd throw it out to them. They could grab hold of it, and he's a great swimmer, and you could just hold on, and he's strong enough, and he could swim you all the way back in. How does Jesus save people? What's his life preserver? How does he do it? Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says, It pleased God that in Jesus all the fullness should dwell, and by Jesus to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You see, Christmas is so special to us because we're not just thinking about that baby, we're thinking about that baby growing into a man. And at around 33 years old, that young man who'd done nothing wrong being nailed to a cross and realizing that his whole life, all he'd done is go around and done good to people. He'd healed so many people. He gave so many people hope, uh, you know, anticipation of a better future, changed their lives. And now here he is crucified. There's a political attack against him. There's people that are lying about him. There's a mock trial. They bring him in. They nail him to a cross. And he dies. But Paul preaching about that name, about that person, he said that God made peace by the blood of Jesus' cross. When we sing peace on earth, goodwill to man, we're not talking about some generic peace that will be brought by the UN. We're talking about the peace with God that was brought by the blood of Jesus. There's a sacrifice for sin. And that sacrifice was Jesus himself. He didn't come and redeem us with his wealth or with his power. He came and redeemed us with his own life. Something incredibly more valuable. Not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb, without spot, without blemish. The lamb of God, Jesus, dying on the cross for our sins and rising from the dead. Paul said in Titus 2 verse 14, that Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. You see, when, it, when the angel said he's going to save his people from their sins, what that means is that Jesus was going to come, that baby that was going to be born, he was going to come and he was going to pay the price. That's what the word redeem means. It means the price has been paid. The price that was paid was the blood of Jesus. And that was paid to buy us and rescue us from the penalty of our lawless deeds. Now, what's interesting about Christmas is that the popular expression of Christmas involves Santa Claus. And remember about Santa Claus? There's a song about him. It says he's making a list, and he overlooks it so that you'll have a chance to get a gift. No. He makes his list, and he checks it twice. Now, that was not, that was not pleasant for me when I was growing up. <laughs> I didn't grow up going to church, so I didn't think about Jesus ever on the holidays. I didn't know who Jesus was at all. I never saw a Bible until I was 15 years old. So I never heard the Christmas story, didn't know anything about it. My, my understanding of Christmas had everything to do with Santa Claus, and my mom used the fear of Santa to make me obey, at least for a few weeks. She would say, you and your brother need to stop fighting. And I would say, why we love it so much, you know. We're always fighting, socking each other, taking each other's stuff, breaking each other's stuff. We were very mean and angry boys. And uh, my brother will tell you I was meaner and angrier, but we'd have to fight about it, you know, even right now still, because he's worse than me. <laughs> but my mom would say, Santa's watching you. And I would tell her, he lives in the North Pole. He can't see me. He's far away. I mean, I live down here in Southern California. He can't see down here. She goes, oh, he has elves. And the elves are everywhere. There might be one right now looking in through the window. I'd look at the window, and I never saw one. But man, I thought, I got to be good. Or he's going to see me do something bad, and then that thing that I really want to get on Christmas, I'm not going to get it. And so it was a bummer, because I was bad all the time. 
And even, I remember sometimes even my brother and I would fight, and we right before Christmas, we'd be punching each other, and he, one of us would say, it's Christmas, you know, we're gonna, he's going to see us. I don't care, you broke my thing. You know, we'd just keep fighting. Is that how Jesus saves? Have you heard of the word grace? You know what it means, the word grace? It means God gives you what you could never earn. He gives you what you don't deserve. God will give you salvation. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord could be saved. Now you might say, does God have a list? Is he checking it twice? Yeah, the Bible does say you're going to be held accountable for every word that you've spoken. There's a record of it. He's not checking it twice. He's omniscient, which means he knows everything, which means checking it once is fine. He didn't have to be checking it. God knows, and our lives are going to be held up in the light of who he is. The exception would be is that Jesus saved you from your sin. If Jesus saved you, if you called on the name of the Lord, you could be redeemed and bought back from your lawless deeds. But that's not all that Paul says in Titus 2.14. That's part of the salvation. The second part is this. He redeemed us from every lawless deeds, the first part. The second part, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now we have a lot of kids here. We have some little boys and little girls that are here listening. And I imagine you probably have some special toys. Maybe you got some Legos. I was just with my little nephew and he was showing me his special Legos. He got some Ninja Turtle Legos. And so those Lego men that are the turtles are more special than the other Lego men. They're, the other Lego guys, you know, some of their heads are missing, arms are missing. They're, they're Frankenstein, you know, they're, he's just mix and match. They're not that big of a deal. But he's pointed out, he's got the new ones. They're special. They're not for anything. And I, look, I go, can I? He's like, sure, Uncle Rich, you can, you can look at them. I knew I was in. You know, let me, these are special. Now, listen, God wants to purify for himself his own special people. What does that mean? God wants to purify for himself his own special people. Do you, you want to be one of God's own special people? Where God says, this is one of my mutant ninjas. <laughs> They're not a turtle, it's a mutant ninja human. This is this one. I've separated them. They're separated. Not because they're better, but because they called on the name of the Lord and they got saved. They got redeemed from every lawless deed. The price was paid. You got saved from your sins. But then God purifies for himself his own special people. And the very last phrase is one of the wonderful parts of Christmas. Paul goes on to say, they're zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. You get set free from the power of sin. When you're in your sins, what are you zealous for? You're zealous for sin, aren't you? Man, when I wasn't a Christian, we would plan out our sins. We would carefully and meticulously try to come up with some new way of sinning. How we would do the things that we would do, when we would do them. Where we would get the things that we would get to do the things that we wanted to do. There was careful planning. We were very zealous for our sin. But you get redeemed from your sin. The, the price has been paid. It's no longer controlling you. But, you're, but now your life... What happens to your life? You get separated and you get purified and now you're zealous for good works. You're zealous for God's plan for your life. So exciting. When I think about Christmas, I think about God sending his son into the world and that I get saved from my sins and that I get to have a brand new life. That's worth celebrating, isn't it? That's worth stopping everything. Stop it all. Nobody works on this day. Well, we don't even know what day he was born. Who cares? Let's pick one. Stop everything. And on this day, let's remember that God sent his son and that Jesus came, that God loved us so much that he would give us eternal life, that his son would come and redeem us from every lawless deed and that he would then separate us and make us his own special people and now our life could matter for his kingdom. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for your son. Thank you for sending him. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you're here. We love all these Christmas songs, Lord. Some of them are old, and the musical style is, is no longer popular. It's no longer in vogue. 
the words maybe even sounding a little archaic. And yet, God, we just think about for <laughs> going way back, people singing songs about your salvation. And every song of salvation is all about Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the song of salvation. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you, Lord, for letting us have a chance to gather and remember what the day is really all about. I pray you'd bless every family that's represented here. I think about how that jailer who had beaten Paul and his friend Silas, Paul preached about the name of Jesus to him and told him that he and his household would get saved. Lord, I pray that you would do a work not only in our lives, but in our household, that our family, our loved ones, that they would come to know Jesus, their hearts would be softened, and that people that are in bondage to sin would be awakened to be set free. Lord, thank you that you are a Savior. I don't want to close tonight without giving you a chance to pray. So with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed, I want to just keep an attitude of prayer. And if you want to call on the name of the Lord and be saved, I want to give you a chance right now. If you know that you need a Savior, you want to open your heart to Jesus, then you can call on Him and He'll hear you. He'll save you. He'll cleanse you. He'll make you His own special person. He'll keep the promises that He's made. Just surrender to Him. So pray with me. Say directly to Jesus and repeat after me and say, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins. And I ask you to come into my heart right now. I need a Savior. Thank you that you're a great Savior. So save me. I surrender my life to you. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. And help me to live for you. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for giving us the chance to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Lord, you're the only one who knows hearts. God, I pray that, that every person would be able to recognize what your Spirit's saying to them even right now. As you're calling some that have drifted away, you're saying, why don't you just come home? I'm not going to reject you. Come back. I don't care what you've done. Just, just come back. I'll clean you up. You can have a fresh start. Lord, speak to, speak to people as we remember Jesus. Thank you so much for Christmas. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.